apologize for the bad lighting, but it is in the evening time. It is past six o'clock and I'm only just now thinking about coming on here and starting the vlog. In all honesty, absolutely nothing was going on today. And so I didn't even think about really picking up the camera until right now. So I wanted to go ahead and do it before I got in the bath and my hair was all crazy and things like that. I actually do have a reading update for you because I filmed my February TBR yesterday and I decided that I was gonna go ahead and cheat a little bit and start my February TBR early. And one of the main reasons why I decided to do that was because there are some challenging reads. I pulled one recommendation from y'all. It is an autobiography of a person that I've never heard of before. It's not only that, but it's an older autobiography. It's like 30 years old. And I literally have zero interest in reading the story, but it's part of the project. My purpose in this project is to read like y'all, not to read what I wanna read. So I accept that as part of this project. Also, I pulled a couple of challenge prompts for reading challenges that I'm doing that I'm not necessarily the most interested in satisfying because I have absolutely like nothing on my TBR to satisfy the challenge prompts. Basically, I was like, you know what? Let me get a jump on these books and just kind of bust through them and get them out of the way. And so the rest of my TBR will hopefully be smooth sailing, but I don't know because I was expecting that in January and it didn't work out for me. One of the challenge prompts that I pulled was to read a book written by a neurodivergent author. And I scoured and scoured trying to find a book that was already on my TBR that would satisfy this. And apparently I don't have any books on my TBR by neurodivergent authors. Like all of the books that were written by neurodivergent authors that I was interested in, I had like already read. So I was just kind of researching and apparently Agatha Christie was neurodivergent. I just decided to go ahead and pick up one of her books, a book called Cricket House. It supposedly is one of her favorite books that she's ever written. And it was very short. I knew that I could bust through it really quickly. And so I did. It has been many years since I read an Agatha Christie, y'all. I think I was in middle school the last time I read an Agatha Christie. And so I started it yesterday and I finished it today. And it's kind of exactly what I was expecting. It was nothing super amazing to me, but at the same time, I feel like my experience with Agatha Christie is kind of ruined by all of the thrillers that I've read in my life because I feel like a lot of the inspiration for current thrillers and a lot of the tropes that we see so often these days was inspired by Agatha Christie. And so reading these original books, it's like not as thrilling as it once was when she was writing the books. Like I feel like she was very ahead of her time and I feel like she just created these really wild and twisty stories and I'm not able to appreciate them as much as I would have had I been reading Agatha Christie a long time ago, if that makes sense. So Crooked House is basically about rich people behaving badly. It follows our main character, Charles, who is set to marry this woman named Sophie and Sophie's grandfather has been murdered. And so Charles kind of goes in to help investigate what's going on in this family because his father, who is part of Scotland Yard, is also tasked with investigating and he wants Charles's help because of his connection with Sophia. And so you're kind of following this investigation and you're not sure who did it. Everybody seemed to have a motive and it was a good fun time. I enjoyed my reading experience of it. It wasn't anything that's going to stick with me for sure. Although, you know, I definitely liked the who did it. And again, I think that revelation would have been absolutely mind-blowing back when she wrote the story, which I believe was in like 1949. And it could still even be shocking to people who don't typically read these types of books. But of course, I did like the way that it was crafted. I liked Agatha Christie's writing. I didn't have a bad time with it at all. I'm giving it a solid three stars and one book on my February TBR is down. So now I'm going to go ahead and jump into that autobiography that I'm really not looking forward to reading. It is Autobiography of a Face by Lucy Greeley. Apparently she was a prominent poet back in the 90s. And so this is about her after she was diagnosed with cancer at nine and like a third of her jaw was removed and like what that did to her in her life because you know the self-esteem issues and everything like that that came along with it. I'm gonna bust through it. I'm gonna finish it tomorrow and move on to the next. But for now y'all it is time for my bath. I'm gonna go and relax and bath, prepare for the week, and I will talk to you when I've finished Autobiography of a Face. <laughs> Everybody, it is currently Tuesday morning and we're gonna see how this goes because this is the very first vlog clip that I'm filming on my new phone and I don't have like a case or a pop socket or anything on it yet so it's a little bit harder to hold so we're gonna see how this goes. I have a feeling that I'm going to both love and hate the quality of this camera at the same time because I can already tell like it is showing all my flaws on my face but whatever it's fine. So I wanted to come on here because I have some reading updates. I did ultimately end up starting and finishing the autobiography of a face by Lucy Greeley and it was 
was basically exactly what I thought. It was fine, but it was nothing mind-blowing. It was nothing that I connected to emotionally. It wasn't even anything that really held my interest, but I went into the book kind of knowing that that was going to happen, and because of that, I feel like I do need to add a restriction to this project that I'm doing where I'm reading like my subscribers and just not allow any more memoirs or autobiographies to be recommended to me. I did want to place many restrictions on this project because the ultimate goal was to read like you, right? And so if you love to read autobiographies, then that's something that I need to consider. But I feel like if I'm going into a book knowing that I'm probably going to hate it or dislike it, I think that's just asking for a slump and I really don't want that to happen. So I think going forward, anytime I come across a memoir that was recommended to me, I'm just going to go ahead and skip it. So if you know that you have recommended a memoir to me, please feel free to go back to the video and provide me some additional recommendations. I don't know if I gave a full synopsis of Autobiography of a Face, but Lucy Greeley was a popular poet and memoirist in the 90s, and Autobiography of a Face is essentially a memoir of a specific period of time in her life, basically from the age of nine to her early college years, and what she endured medically during that time, because when she was a young kid, she was diagnosed with a cancer. It was like a sarcoma, and it eventually led to her having a third of her jaw removed. She ultimately underwent multiple rounds of chemotherapy over several years and then reconstructive surgery and things like that. It's ultimately about identity and what part beauty plays in identity because she went a long time believing that she was undesirable and not beautiful because of what happened to her face and all of the relentless teasing and taunting and bullying that she experienced. And I will say that that definitely was relatable. It was fascinating, especially the medical aspects to it. And I definitely understand why her story is important. I'm not trying to say that her story was unimportant. It's just like to me, I have a hard time getting emotionally attached or invested in memoirs by people I don't know. And as per usual, I'm not really going to rate this story because I have a problem reading non-fictions, especially memoirs, because I feel like I'm reading their story. And then, like I said, in addition, I kind of went into it knowing that I wasn't going to enjoy it. So I don't feel like it's fair to assign a rating to this book. But ultimately, again, it is a book that exists and I read it and it's done and it's over with. Sorry, y'all. I had to prop up my arm. It is hard work holding up a camera, I swear. Anyway, in terms of what I'm reading now, I decided to pick up Last Thing to Burn by Will Dean. This is satisfying a gameplay prompt of reading the shortest book on my TBR. This book is extremely compelling in my opinion. It follows our main character who is known as Jane, but that is not her real name. And basically it's following her in captivity because she and her sister came to the United Kingdom from Vietnam and they were basically lured there under false pretenses. And she was essentially sold to a man named Len. And Len has basically been holding her hostage for the past, I think it's like seven or nine years. I'm not entirely sure on the time frame, but he lets her wander around the house. She's not like captive in a basement or anything, but he threatens her with the safety of her sister. Like if she does not do what he says, he's going to call a friend of his and her sister is going to be deported and things like that. And so, like I said, she has the full range of the house, but she's basically his slave, his maid. She has to cook and clean for him. There are cameras constantly watching her. So he knows her every movement. Like every single night when he gets home, he watches the cameras. And then she finds out that she is pregnant because naturally part of this captivity means that she is forced to have have sex with him and she winds up pregnant and this baby becomes her entire world, her hope, and she is determined to survive and maybe even escape so that she can give her baby the best life possible. And you're following this all through the entirety of her perspective. So you are seeing absolutely everything that she is going through and what an unreasonable man Len is. Like in his own way, he cares for her, but he has such a rigid way of viewing the world and the way things should be. And he's very hung up on his mother. He's like, well, my mother did it this way, so you can do it this way. And he won't buy her anything new. When she has her period, she has to use old rags that his mother also used. You know what I mean? And when she has the baby, she doesn't have any diapers. She has to use these same rags as a diaper for her baby. And it's really intense. Like you can imagine just being in the situation and what it is like. And then one day something changes. A girl who is new to the area comes knocking on their door because she is looking to buy land so she can house a horse that she plans to buy. And Lan has a bunch of land. He is a farmer. And so he's basically home all day. He can see all of his land. He knows exactly when anybody's coming and going. And essentially Len ends up taking her captive as well. It is intense y'all. For a short book, this is definitely packing the kind of punch you are looking for. So like I said, I will definitely be finishing that today. I don't know what I'm going to start next, but I'm just so thankful to be reading a book right now that I am invested in and I'm really, really interested in because the last few books that I've read for the most part have not been like that. So I'm going to continue my read of Last Thing to Burn and I am of course still reading Kingdom of Ash. I am getting further and further to the end. I have under 300 pages at this point so I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. It is definitely getting more and more intense and so I think what I'm going to go ahead and do is turn on the audiobook while I read sitting here at work with like nothing else going on and try to bust through that. All right y'all this was a long one but I will check in with you when I have more reading updates. <music>
Hi everybody, it is now Wednesday. I am just about to head into work, but I do have some reading updates for you because last night I did end up finishing The Last Thing to Burn by Will Dean and I really enjoyed it. This was a solid four star read and what was really notable about it to me was that there was a distinct intensity to it. I believe I mentioned that our main character has been sold to this guy named Len. She's essentially a victim of human trafficking and she is basically his wife for all intents and purposes. Like she has to do all of the cooking, all of the cleaning. He wants the meals exactly like his mom made it. Of course, she's sexually assaulted on a regular basis and then she winds up pregnant and because of that, she is vowing to do everything she can to get her daughter out of the situation. You're definitely worried for her and the safety of her daughter and then you become worried about the third person that ends up becoming a hostage of Lent as well. And overall, I just thought that it was really well done. It was not a long book at all. It was, I think, just under 250 pages. So it went really quick. It was certainly completely impulsively readable. You wanted to know what was going to happen. You wanted to know what the outcome was. And considering it was so short, I felt like it packed a pretty big punch. Like I said, there was an intensity in that story that I don't normally feel. And so I give big props to Will Dean for being able to do that in such a short story. I think Will Dean has just now become an autobi thriller author. I really enjoyed First Born by him, especially with the twists that he threw into that. And now after this one, I am certainly wanting to read more from him because I think he just knows how to craft a solid, engaging, well-written thriller and I highly recommend. So immediately after finishing Last Thing to Burn and kind of being reinvigorated with thrillers, I decided to go ahead and pick up The Chain by Adrian McGinty. That was another one that I was a little bit skeptical about. It has been on my TBR for so long and even though I had heard really good things about it, I was a little bit nervous especially because his newer release called The Island has not been getting like great reviews and so I wasn't sure if I even wanted to read The Chain if I wasn't going to bother with anything else that he'd written. But I'm really glad that I pulled it from my TBR and that I'm giving it a chance because I am really really enjoying this one as well. It really just throws you right in so it is very fast. It is of course compulsively readable. It is page turning. It is certainly keeping me engaged and interested in wanting to know what is going to happen. So this basically follows kind of like a white collar kidnapping ring essentially. Basically what happens is a child is kidnapped and the parents of that child are called and they are given a set of very detailed instructions. They need to come up with $25,000 in ransom. They also need to kidnap another child. And so we're following our main character Rachel and she is on the way to a doctor's appointment when she gets a call that her daughter Kylie has been kidnapped. She's been kidnapped by a set of parents whose son is currently kidnapped and in order for them to get their son back Rachel has to do exactly what they say so that she can then get Kylie back as well and it is incredibly interesting because there are so many things to think about and so many steps to take as you're trying to not only come up with all of this money but figure out how to kidnap a child because you're a parent and you're going to do anything to get your child back even if that means endangering another child and that's what these people count on. They count on the love a parent has for their child and will do anything that they can to get them back. It is very compelling and engaging and I am enjoying myself immensely. I will definitely be continuing with this one. I won't finish it today but I should finish it tomorrow and then basically by February 1st I will already have knocked off four books from my February TBR. I was not expecting that to happen y'all but that just means that I can knock more and more books off of my overall TBR in February. So so far so good and now I must go into work because I have a lot of things to get done today. So that is the reading update and I will check in with you when I have more. Hey guys, it is Thursday afternoon and oh, I am, I'm looking really rough y'all, but I'm going to blame that on Kingdom of Ash because I did actually finish that today. I finished the last 100 pages and holy cow, for the last, I would say at least the last 300 pages of this book, I was in a constant state of stress and fear and tears. And obviously if a book can make me feel all of those emotions, it's an easy five stars. And I did absolutely give it a five stars. I am very grateful to finally be done with this series. I'm glad that I was able to be brave enough to finish the end of the series, but at the same time I'm very sad that it is the end of the series. I'm very sad to say goodbye, although I do hope to see these characters again at some point in the future, and I think that that might be a possibility if you know you know. I also did finish The Chain. When I got to work I only had like 30 minutes left, and so I thought that I would just go ahead and bust through it, and that way I could start fresh with a new book tonight when I'm making dinner. I now have kind of conflicting feelings about The Chain. I originally thought that it was going to be an easy four stars, like a solid four stars, because I I really enjoyed the first part of the book. This book is split into part one and part two and in part one you're dealing with the things that I've kind of already talked to you about. We're following our main character Rachel. Her daughter Kylie has been kidnapped. She is now part of the chain and she has to wire $25,000 in Bitcoin to these mysterious people and she has to go kidnap another child and bring that child's parents into the chain and only once all of that happens is Kylie going to be released. So basically it's like a white collar kidnapping ring and it's making somebody a lot of money. And so part one you get through it and 
and then you still have like a third of the book left maybe more and so you have the after you're following Rachel and Kylie and everything as they're struggling to deal with what happened to them but you're also getting kind of snippets of the people behind the chain and like what their history was like and stuff like that and then all of a sudden you're kind of following Rachel as she's trying to take down the chain and as it was the reveals about who was behind the chain and why were just kind of mediocre to me I wasn't really all that interested in it I wasn't all that impressed by it and I thought that it could have been so much more momentous it just seemed so mediocre and mundane when we all got down to it like the second part of it went more downhill so whereas the first part was a solid four stars I would say part two was closer to like a three stars but overall I did enjoy it I'm not mad about it at all I think I got more out of it than I was expecting it to I was a little bit hesitant going into it but overall it was a decent reading experience and I'm glad to be done in terms of what's next during my TBR I made a challenge pool to read a book that features indigenous characters and I've been trying to determine what book I want to read to satisfy that and I think I've settled on The Berry Pickers by Amanda Peters and offhand I don't really know much about the synopsis of it but I do believe it follows an indigenous family in Nova Scotia and what happens when one of their daughters goes missing so we're gonna see I'm gonna start it on my way to the gym and on my way home and if I'm just not feeling it I might try something else but anyway y'all I'm gonna go ahead and get back to work I will be getting ready to go to the gym in just a few minutes and I will check in with you when I have more reading updates as per usual everybody it is Friday afternoon I am just heading out to lunch but I wanted to come on here really quick and give you an update because I'm about to finish a book that I started and I haven't even told you that I started it so I believe in one of my last clips I mentioned that during my TBR game I pulled the challenge prompt to read a book that featured indigenous peoples and I wasn't sure what I was going to read I ended up choosing Killers of the Flower Moon by David Graham this is a true crime nonfiction that has been on my radar for quite a while I have considered adding it to my book of the month cart on and off for at at least the past couple of years if I'm honest it's essentially covering a string of murders that happened with the Osage in Oklahoma and from what I'm understanding about the story they were originally kind of located in Kansas and then you know the government did their thing pushed them off their land and they ended up on a reservation in Oklahoma but what nobody realized at the time was that this reservation was sitting on a ton of oil and so naturally that made the Osage peoples very very wealthy this is particularly following one person named Molly Burkhardt and essentially a lot of people in her life and her family start to die and it seems like it's a plot to eliminate the people closest to her so that she inherits the majority of her family's wealth which would eventually be shared with her husband Ernest and what I believe this could end up being is a plot between like Ernest and his uncle to make all of this happen I don't know but it essentially all boils down to grief so we're gonna figure out what happens. I only have an hour and 47 minutes of listing time left. So I might actually be able to finish this today, which I was not expecting at all. Overall, I am really enjoying my reading experience of this. It is falling into some of the same traps that a lot of nonfiction typically has when I read it and that a lot of different people are being thrown at you. And that's one of the reasons why I have a hard time with nonfiction is because there's always so many players that you have to learn, so many different names. You have to learn their relationships to the other characters, the context, how they fit in with the overall story. But I am actually finding it pretty easy to follow overall 
overall, I haven't really been lost. And I find that this nonfiction is meandering less than a lot of nonfictions that I read. I don't necessarily need a nonfiction to flow linearly, you know, from point A to point B to point C. I understand the need to tell the story in a certain way where you're starting at point A and then maybe you're jumping to point D and then back to point B and so on and so forth. But I find that a lot of nonfiction includes a lot of extraneous detail that you don't necessarily need to know to understand the stories. I understand that the authors might be trying to paint a picture of the people that are involved and really trying to get you to know and understand them. But I find that I just get lost in those details and it takes me out of the main overall point of the story. This book does some of the meandering a little bit, but not nearly as much as some of the other nonfiction true crime that I've read. And I think that's probably why this is more on the shorter side and why I'm able to bust through it so quickly. So, so far this has been a really solid reading experience and I'm glad that I decided to pick it up. I'm glad that I bit the bullet and decided to pick it up to satisfy this reading challenge. But anyway, y'all, my food is ready and I am hungry. So I'm gonna go grab that and I will check in with you later. everybody. It is currently Monday in the afternoon and I wanted to come on here and give you a verbal update because I didn't do that at all over the weekend. I wasn't necessarily super busy over the weekend but there were a lot of chores and errands that I had to do and I just kind of buckled down and got them done. There was also a lot of booktube content that I had to edit and film and I was just enjoying being productive but I was also productive in terms of reading. I believe that the last verbal update I had I was reading Killers of the Flower Moon by David Grant which I have since completed. I don't necessarily have a lot more thoughts on the book outside of what I already mentioned in Friday's clip. I did ultimately really enjoy it. It was a solid nonfiction reading experience. I appreciated the way that David Graham crafted the story. It wasn't very meandering. I feel like it was very straightforward. It was easy to comprehend and essentially this all boils down to greed and what men are willing to do for money because basically this was about the reign of terror that befell the Osage Indians in the early 1920s. The reservation was on land above oil and a lot of people wanted to get their hands on it. They didn't think it was fair that they were the wealthy and of course all the racial prejudices and things that existed against the Osage were very very prominent during this time and this story is primarily following the unfortunate events that befell the family of Molly Burkhart. It's kind of uncovered that her husband Ernest Burkhart and his uncle William kind of manufactured a conspiracy to essentially eliminate all of Molly's family so that eventually her head right or basically the money that she is owed from the oil profits would eventually flow to Ernest and then by extension his uncle. Now they weren't the only ones involved in a conspiracy such as this. David Grant actually mentions toward the end that he believes that far more than the 24 official people on record that were killed were actually killed and that it started well before 1921 which is when it is believed that the reign of terror began and 1926 I think is when they say that it ended. He believes that it probably spanned at least around two decades and that way more than 24 people were killed because of this which is just absolutely atrocious. So it was certainly a compelling read. It's engaging. It's very very important. This book has recently been adapted by Martin Scorsese. It features some big names like Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro and I'm sure that they're going to do a fantastic job. I haven't decided whether or not I'm going to watch it but I will say that I did really enjoy reading the story and I'm glad that I chose it to satisfy the prompt of reading a book featuring indigenous cultures. So immediately after finishing Killers of the Flower Moon I decided to pick up the next book in the Will Trent series by Karen Slaughter. This is called Fractured. Now I'm going to say Karen Slaughter was asked to go back and write introductions for the first few Will Trent books and I wish that I had not listened to the introduction of this book because not only were there spoilers for things to come in the Will Trent series but there was a spoiler for the final book in the Grant County series and wouldn't you know that was the one and only book that I have left in the Grant County series. So do you need to read the Grant County series to understand what happens in Will Trent? No and in fact Will Trent to my knowledge is not featured in the Grant County series at all but eventually some of the characters from Grant County are featured in Will Trent and so Grant County is going to give you a context but apparently there's something pretty big that happens in the final book in the Grant County series that I did not know of and 
and now I do. And again, the crossovers between Grant County and Will Trent were kind of spoiled as well in the introduction. It's not gonna really ruin anything for me. I think I'm still going to be able to go into the final Grant County book and still be as emotionally affected as if I hadn't known of it. But just be very, very warned if you are reading the Will Trent series before Grant County and you still have plans to read the Grant County series. But anyway, I started and finished Fractured. It was one that I just wanted to keep reading. I didn't want to stop and I love when a book is able to do that. Karen Slaughter, you already know, is my thriller queen. She is dark, she's gruesome, she's gritty, she's not afraid to put her characters through some shit. And I just love the way that this woman's mind works and her stories are always so incredibly engaging and compelling and it was no different with Fractured. If you're not familiar, Will Trent is a special agent for the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. In this particular book, you're following a case where a woman comes home one day and she goes upstairs and she finds a man standing over the body of what she believes is her daughter. And so when this man comes after her, she attacks him and kills him. But it later comes out that this boy was actually not the killer. He was actually trying to help the person that was on the floor and it wasn't this woman's daughter. And so there's a lot of other things at play that Will is trying to figure out. And as always, this was just something that was really well crafted and I just enjoyed it overall. It was a solid, solid four stars. As always, it's not gonna get like any higher of a rating because there wasn't really any emotional impact to the story for me, but it was probably one of the better crime thrillers that I've read this year. And then immediately after finishing Fracture this morning, I did go ahead and decide to jump into No One Can Know by Kate Alice Marshall. I've been kind of procrastinating on reading that after the devastating disappointments that were The Fury and Only If You're Lucky. I was really afraid to jump into another new release by an author that I've enjoyed in the past because I was afraid it was going to be a disappointment. Now I'm very, very early in the story. I only listened to it on my commute to work, which is 25 minutes. So I maybe got through less than an hour total of the audiobook. But what I'm gathering so far is that this is following our main character, Emma. And when she was 16 years old, her parents were brutally killed in their home. And after that, her and her younger sister were placed in foster care. Her older sister was already 18. So she went off to college and never looked back. And she really hasn't seen or talked to her sisters since. And she certainly hasn't returned to her parents' home. But now she and her husband are kind of in a very big financial bind. She just found out she's pregnant and they really need to save some money. So they are going back to this house, which all three sisters still own. But again, none of them have been back there. So they're gonna kind of live there until they get back on their feet. And I assume a lot of secrets are gonna be revealed because it sounds like Emma knows something about what happened to her parents or potentially that they all three were involved in something that happened to their parents. I have no idea, but I am here for it. Already, I really enjoy Kate Alice Marshall's writing style. I am here for it. I am definitely interested. I wanna know what is going to happen. Anyway, y'all, I've been talking for flipping ever. So I'm gonna go ahead and get back to work and I'll check in with you later when I have more of a reading update on No One Else Can Know. It is currently Wednesday and I'm about to head into work, but I've been sitting out in my car for like the past 10 minutes because I was so close to finishing No One Can Know by Kate Ellis Marshall and I didn't want to go into work without it being finished. So I'm happy to say that I did finish it and I really, really enjoyed it, thankfully. I was worried that this is going to be another disappointing thriller and a string of disappointing thrillers, but thankfully this one lived up to my expectations. I don't remember whether or not I gave you a full synopsis of this, but basically this follows three sisters and when they were young, both of their parents were shot and killed and there was always suspicion around the sisters thinking that one of them had done it but particularly Emma. She's like the main sister of focus here so she's lived under a cloud of suspicion her whole entire life. She was put into foster care after her parents were killed. She and her sisters were separated and they basically never talked again. They were kind of estranged at that point point. and so Emma grew up. She got married. She just found out she's going to have a baby but she and her husband are in pretty dire financial straits and in order to save some money they decide to go ahead and move back into the house that Emma grew up in and where her parents died. Now Emma is not exactly happy about this. You know the house obviously holds some very bad memories and the town doesn't exactly want her there. They think that she is a murderer but they go back to live and then of course all of the secrets are revealed about what happened. So you are actually getting the perspective of all three sisters in the present and the perspective of all three sisters in the past. And I've said this multiple times before but a thriller doesn't necessarily have to shock me in order for it to be good but what it does have to do is it has to take me on a very engaging and compelling 
storytelling journey to get from point A to point Z. It doesn't really necessarily matter where we end up as long as I enjoyed the journey. And I can't say that I predicted what the ending of this was going to be. I wouldn't say that this was predictable at all. In fact, I think K. Alice Marshall did a very good job of weaving together a very, very clever story. There were definitely a few players. There were a few twists and turns going on here and I didn't ultimately see where it was gonna end up. But in addition to that, she did just create this very captivating journey that I was happy to go on. I really enjoyed all of it. I think the only thing that would really have made it better for me in terms of audiobook listening is if there had been three separate narrators for each perspective. But ultimately I was able to follow along pretty well. I wasn't getting any of the perspectives confused. I understood exactly what was happening. So ultimately this was a very positive reading experience. K. Alice Marshall has now a certainly become an auto buy thriller author for me. I'm very grateful that this one ended up meeting my expectations. So now I'm actually going to switch gears a little bit and I'm going to be listening to Happy Place by Emily Henry. That is not a book that was on my official February TBR, but it was the book that was sent to me in January as part of one of the gifting groups that I'm a part of. And I'm trying to read those as they come into me. So I'm going to go ahead and listen to it, especially as it just came in from my library. Very happy with the progress that I'm making this month. And now I have to go ahead and head into work because I have a few things that I need to get done this morning before everything gets crazy. So I'll check in with you when I started happy place. February 10th and I wanted to come on here and formally wrap up this vlog. I have since finished Happy Place by Emily Henry so that's the last book that I'm going to be talking about here. I don't think I ever gave a synopsis of it but basically this follows our two main characters Harriet and Wynne and they have been deeply in love since college and they've been together for eight years but recently they have broken up about five months prior to the start of the story. They broke up. It was Wynne who did the breaking up and Harriet is not handling it well. She doesn't understand what happened, what went wrong, why Wynne broke up with her even though she knows that they've been kind of growing apart for the last several months. And it is time for Harriet to take an annual trip that she goes to meet with her best friends. Basically her and Wynne were part of a very tight friendship group. And every single year they go out to this vacation home in Maine that one of her friend's parents own. And it's been basically like a lifeline for her. This is one of the only times that they ever see each other because they all live in different places. They do different things. And so she is going out there to see them. And if I remember correctly, she's kind of told them that Wynne can't make it for one reason or another. But lo and behold, when she gets to this vacation house, in Maine, Wynne is there and there's a particular reason why he was told that he had to be there because essentially the vacation home is being sold. This is going to be their last summer there and obviously this is a time of great change for everybody. They're losing a part of themselves, a part of their history and so they're trying to make it the best vacation that they could possibly make it. But nobody knows that Harry and Wynne have broken up and so for the sake of the time that they're together, they have made the decision to pretend like they are together, that nothing is wrong, that they have not broken up. And naturally this creates some complications because between them it is very awkward, it is very stilted but they have to pretend like it's not and at the same time being together all of the old thoughts all of the old feelings connection the attraction just comes back it's natural to them to confide in each other to be there for each other to want each other and things like that so you're following them as they're trying to navigate this very precarious situation on the one hand you can tell that they both still deeply love each other they want to be together they're very attracted to each other but on the other hand they are broken up and there's something that has come between them it's very difficult working through all of these things while also trying to pretend to be together for the sake of their friends and what is going on that week 
So naturally, like every other Emily Henry book, I very much enjoyed the reading experience of this. I feel like Emily Henry is a very talented author and she does banter like no other. And overall, I very much like the characters and the plots that she comes up with. I feel like she's a pretty solid romance writer. I will say that this one was not necessarily my favorite. That will probably always go to book lovers and kind of like book lovers. This was not just about a romantic relationship, whereas book lovers also featured heavily a sibling relationship. This also features heavily a friendship group and friendship dynamic. You're almost equally following what's going on between Harry and Wynne as you are following what's going on in the friendship group and how the friendship group itself has kind of grown apart over the past couple of years. Like I said, they are all spread out across the country. They all have very different things going on and you can kind of tell that they are not the same as they once were in college and they're starting to feel their dynamic shift and it's all kind of hitting them all at once because now they're losing this vacation house. They're not as close as they once were and it all kind of comes to a head in this story. And so I enjoyed each individual section of the book, watching Harry and Wynn struggle as well as the friendship group struggle and how it all kind of resolves itself and comes together. I think I'm going to go ahead and give this a four stars. Like I said, it's not my favorite Emily Henry. I wasn't as emotionally invested in this as I thought that I could be. And I will be honest and say that it did feel a little bit redundant at points. I felt like this could be a little bit long for what it was. It felt like there was so much of Harry and Wynn doing the same thing, like coming together, pulling apart, coming together, pulling apart as they were trying to navigate these very complicated emotions that they had with each other. And it felt a little bit repetitive at times. And also I wouldn't say that this was a story that hindered on miscommunication, but it is a story that hindered on a lack of communication. I feel like Harriet and Wynne's relationship ultimately fell apart because they were not talking to each other and they were not expressing the emotions that they were having. And had they done that, they would have been able to avoid the whole thing. Similarly with the friendship group, it was all centered around a lack of communication. And so while that doesn't annoy me as much as miscommunication, I do think that a book that relies on a lack of communication in order to make a story possible is a little bit lazy overall. But also at the same time, it's totally relatable and it's totally natural. I don't think that we always are the best at communicating with the people we love. I think it's especially the hardest to communicate with the people that we love, especially if we are having complicated emotions. So I think that's why it didn't necessarily bother me all that much when I was reading it. But there was that aspect of a lack of communication that I felt drove the story and I would have preferred if it kind of had gone in a different direction. So overall, not my favorite Emily Henry, but it was still a very strong reading experience. It was a sweet, tender, somewhat hard hitting romance between Harriet Wynn and I enjoyed watching their dynamic throughout the story. I have now started When the Stars Go Dark by Paul McLean. This is a book of the month book that has been on my TBR for years at this point and I'm glad to be getting to it but I will be sure to update you on what that story is about in the next clip when I start the next vlog because this one is running on long at this point so I'm gonna stop blabbering on. I'm gonna go ahead and close out this vlog and I will see you in the next one.